Gordon Gecko. Did he have it right? I've worked for them. Some of the real life Gordon Gecko transparency. That is what is necessary on Wall Street. The most successful people are people that. Jason Mandel, an insider's insider, money and business expert, Wall Street veteran with 30 years of experience. His new book, Demand Transparency, blows the lid off Wall Street dealers. I think Wall Street is corrupt and people are being badly advised. I live that Wall Street life. I knew people with drug addictions, sexual addictions, a lot of alcoholics. A lot of people had an addiction to work. And here's the sad reality. What's the implication for people that work in organizations like this? I was working 18, sometimes 20 hours a day, and that's why I almost died. Why aren't more people taking advantage of this? Because Wall Street can't get paid on these products. That's the problem. Okay, it's about money. It's about money. It's all about money. It always is. And when I retire, cha-ching! These products don't pay Wall Street very well, so Wall Street's not going to tell you about it. But the secret that no one realizes is... Listening to. Welcome to What the Tech, your gateway to business strategies and tech secrets shaping today's workplace. You know, one of the most shadowy as well as most glamorized places to work has always been Wall Street. At least they lead us to believe that on, <laughs> uh, on some of the movies. I wonder if there'll ever be a blockbuster movie about organizations that are selling voice cloud services. Oh, uh, well, you know, the most famous one is kind of Zoom-ish. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a uh, a movie in the works or a book in the works that talks about Zoom, but um, you know you can't rule it out. If it's it has the potential to make money, you better believe it'll be a movie. There's a lot of awesome scenes in some of these movies. That at you know being a sales guy for 20 plus years, a lot of people will go back and reference that. So looking forward to this conversation today. <laughs> but you know, Dave, instead of Zoom. Let's go back to Wall Street because Wall Street, there's a lot of people. Do we get daily barrage of, for me, I, I mean, I, I watch the news and CNBC and all the different financial, Bloomberg and the rest. And, you know, we get a take, you know, what we see on the screen. If you're, if you're old like us and you watch the TV, like, I don't know if the kids are watching the TV, but I do. I, I watch <laughs> the TV still and I do consume a hefty amount of stuff on my phone as well. Uh, but we have somebody today that can give us some insights into Wall Street and, and what's happening at Wall Street. You know, I'm curious to find out if AI is impacting what's happening there. I suspect it is because I don't think any workplace is immune from AI and how it's shaping the workplace there and what's, what we can expect. Both if you're an investor, whether you have a little bit stashed in a 401k somewhere, or you are, you know, like some of the entrepreneurs that listen to us, you've got a lot more stashed in there and you've got a lot more rioting on the market. So I want to peel back the curtain a little bit with um, our guest today. But before we get to Jason, Dave, do we have big props? You know, big props to Dr. Randy Ross. Randy Ross, the author of Remarkable and many other books. Hey, Randy, we had a great conversation with you. We really appreciated the input that you had. You know, we talked about successful and unsuccessful uh, company cultures, how they start, how they're maintained. And, you know, we're looking forward to having you back on. I know that you're working on another book. But listen, mm -hmm. if you guys want to hear a fantastic conversation, check out our previous episode with Dr. Randy Ross. All right. Thank you, Dave. Let's welcome to the show, Jason Mandel. Hey guys, hey, thanks so much for having me. Hey, bro. Hey, Dick. Where are you checking in from today? Beautiful Boca Raton, Florida. Paradise. Sunny Florida, also known as New York South. <laughs> These days, for sure. I came a little, I came in 2019 before the masses, but uh, you're absolutely right. It is a lot of uh, inflow from the Northeast, which is good and bad, uh, but it is a lot of fun now. And there are a substantial amount of financial firms that are relocating here due to the tax situation here. Very favorable. No, well, you don't have state income tax in the state of Florida. You And Dave's in one of those states too, except it's icy cold at this time of the year. It, it is icy cold, Southern New Hampshire. So no state income tax. However, property taxes are certainly a little bit higher. So they get you one way or another. At least that's that's what I've, that's our philosophy up here. <laughs> I, I I love the fact that you are a New Yorker. You're from Massapequa. I lived for some time in Brooklyn. I want to show you something, a video clip, that I want you to give me your reaction, your thoughts, because it's going to lead part of the conversation that we're going to have today. So, Ori, go ahead and roll that clip. 
point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind, and greed, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. The quintessential Wall Street archetype, Gordon Gecko. You worked in Wall Street. Did he have it right? Greed is good. I, I think the word greed might not be the best word. I think market efficiency is good, is truth. And I named my book Demand Transparency because that's really my core belief. And I think that is what is necessary on Wall Street. That is what is necessary to save our country. That is what's necessary to bolster employees' morale, to get people to put in discretionary work effort, to help lead businesses to the highest levels. I think in concept, what he's talking about is being able to be efficient, being able to work hard to maximize profits. There's nothing wrong with that. But I do believe that you do need to treat your employees with sensitivity. I do think you need to help them achieve their maximum potential output. And that's what a lot of the work that I've done over the past 30 years has done. We want to maximize every dollar for shareholders. That's what Wall Street's mon mantra is. That makes sense. When you see that movie. I've met people like that. They're in the trenches. They're fighting every day, maximize profits. But I think the most successful people that I've had the pleasure of helping and working with are people that balance that with a respect for their employees, with a respect for honesty, transparency. Uh, and I think you can do both. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think those personalities like Gordon Gecko is <laughs> obviously fictional, but I've met some of the real life Gordon Geckos. I've worked for them. I know <laughs> what these people are all about. And here's the sad reality. Almost all of them are miserable. They're both wow. miserable in dealing with them, right? But they're also miserable themselves. Is they it something that, is it, is it personally? The, so if you were to, to, move, to separate the, the uh, Wall Street aspect of it and you sat down with them and had a cup of coffee, you would still say, these are miserable people to have coffee with. These are people that have prioritized money over all other things, right? They've mm -hmm. sacrificed their relationships with their spouse, with their children, with their parents, with their friends. Everything is about money because when you achieve that extraordinary level of success, like the fictional character there, you're going to do things that other people are unwilling to do, right? So for me, if you look at what happened to me on Wall Street, and I'm a, I'm a good person to think about. I let my, when I met my wife, I was 148 pounds. I'm only 5'6". I'm a short guy. I was 148. By, uh, as of two years ago, I was 225 pounds. Oh, my God. I, it was, I was massive. You weren't bulking and up. You weren't, I you was weren't... big. I was a big boy. And, and you know what? You know what was my drug? I never drank. A lot of people on Wall Street are alcoholics. I never did drugs. Tons of guys do drugs. Is that the I, dirty secret on Wall Street? You know, uh, we think of like, you know, very well put together folks. I mean, that's that's the thing, you know, when you watch the movies and the TV series, you got it all well put together, buttoned up, you know, it, but is that dirty secret? There's no more ties on Wall Street. No more ties. <laughs> it's done. No, what, what you're going to find is people have vices and like anywhere in the world. But when you're in a career where literally you're sitting at your desk and trading millions of shares of stock, any one minute you could lose your job, obviously, is a high level of stress. And when you have that level of stress, people are going to do things to relieve that stress. So unfortunately, where I work, different firms, I knew people with drug addictions, um, sexual addictions, uh, people, a lot of alcoholics. Um, a lot of people had an addiction to work. People don't really think about that. And that's really where I became addicted to my work, where I was working 18, sometimes 20 hours a day. Ooh. And of course, sitting at my desk all those hours, I was eating whatever I wanted or because I didn't care. I thought I was uh, immune from anything. And that's why I gained weight, developed terrible type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. And I, I almost died. I had diabetic ketoacidosis. I, I lived that Wall Street life. You know, I wasn't running around, you know, with prostitutes the way you'd see. I wasn't running around, you know, doing drugs. 
my drug of choice was a big steak every night. If I had a bad day, I had a steak. If I had a good day, I had a steak, right? It didn't matter. But I was eating all the sides, everything you can imagine, and eventually caught up with me. And I became very ill. And I made a decision to change my life. I couldn't quite figure out how to get out of that diabetic train that I called myself that I was on. I had to get, I had to get off that train. And I did a gastric bypass uh, procedure. I actually lost 90 plus pounds wow. and I got rid of my diabetes. And I couldn't figure out how to do it naturally. I needed the help of, uh, of a surgical procedure. But I'm so glad I did it because now I could tell you I feel good. I've got my energy. I'm down to 128 pounds. I'm less than what I used to be. Now I want to bulk up a little bit, start to work out and get back. <laughs> You've got to some great gyms not far from where you're at. Absolutely. Now that's the next step of my iteration. I just turned 50 years old last Wednesday. So for me, you know, this is a new beginning. I wasn't even able to publish my ideas over my career because I worked for very wealthy people that wouldn't allow me to publish. They wanted my strategies just to themselves, uh, which is I guess, the nature of Wall Street. But I didn't want to do that anymore. I've, I've reached a certain level of success where I'm a little bit more flexible in assignments that I take on. And I love helping people. So I ended up publishing the book. Uh, I no longer have those kind of relationships where I'm not allowed to publish. I've written actually two more books that'll come out over this year and next year. And I want to share these ideas because I really believe, you know, Ro, Dave, I think people are being badly advised. I think Wall Street is corrupt. I think Wall Street is doing what it needs to do to hold on to your money. They're going to do the bare minimums. They could charge you 1% every year. And they're showing you strategies that are inferior to strategies that are out there. And the is, is, that because, is that because that's the default, the way we've always done business? And that's kind of the way we do things still today. Or is that under threat with new technology, AI, a, n a new way of working? Or, or, or where do you see that playing? How do you see that playing out? Yeah, I mean, Wall Street's constantly under change. I remember when I started in 1995, the stock, uh, the pricing of stocks was done in eighths. And then all of a sudden it went to decimalization. So there was a smaller spread. And that changed and made things more efficient. Right now you have AI, it's making things more efficient. What I'm finding is it's making dumb people sound smart, right? <laughs> because all they do is type in something, uh, the chat GBT, and then they start to regurgitate it to their clients. They may not even understand what they're talking about. I was amazed when clients, uh, when people would come to me and say, well, my broker told me that what I need to do is balance between stocks and bonds. And you know, I'll always make money because when stocks go down, bonds go up. Well, that mm -hmm. didn't happen two years ago, right? Interest mm -hmm. rates went up, bonds went down. Stock market got weak, it went down. So that, that, that's a flawed concept. And most of the Wall Street investment banks, that is, that are, those are the only tools they have to help you manage your wealth is stocks or bonds. Now, we have a very minute allocation to stocks and bonds. We actually look at other strategies that do not correlate to the stock or bond market. They offer what's called orthogonal return streams. They don't have anything to do with each other. If we have a strategy that does, uh, if you take it to its simplest and you think about a bank, a bank lends money normally for mortgages. They ask you to put down 20 or 30% cash and then they'll lend you money to buy a house. The collateral is the house. Mm -hmm. If you don't pay your mortgage, they take the house from you. Indeed. And hopefully, right, their risk is when they sell it, they get back their money. They have a 20% or 30% cushion Plus, they have the historic reality that sometimes real estate goes up and it's gone up dramatically over the past 20 plus years. So they have that going for them and hopefully they make money. We as investors look at strategies that kind of mimic what a bank does, but allows an individual to do similar type lending. Suddenly, like we call it asset back lending. If someone has an asset, you can lend something against it at a discount to its present value. All right. So so let, hold company, on. Let's, let's slow down. Let's slow down for a moment. Well, you know, let's, from New York, say, I can't slow down. This is my only speed. What are you talking I'm gonna, about? I'm going to take You're your New York gear and all shift right, it down a little bit. All <laughs> right, all right. Yeah, I'll do it for you. So, you we, so if you've got somebody that says, yeah, I've got, you should say that house as an asset or other assets um, that you could use as collateral, how does that work, right? You know, I'm, I'm looking around to diversify my portfolio a little bit. How do I actually do that? And how does it really work for... Uh, you know, the individual investor. Well, I, I've always had some shocking opinions that most people disagree with or most traditional advisors disagree with. So uh, it does. it's not going to surprise you to know I have a very different opinion when it comes to real estate. 
Um, I have no problem that most people have a bulk of their net worth tied up in their real estate. If they were lucky enough to buy a house 10, 20 years ago, they've made a lot of money. I actually propose to most people to consider getting a home equity line of credit. And the idea mm -hmm. there is that's based on today's value of real estate. You might have doubled your money in your real estate and you're feeling very rich. And I'm happy for those people that feel that way. But I have to remind them that real estate is cyclical. It doesn't always go up. Sometimes it goes down. And if we enter a period where it goes down in value, that inflated perception of your net worth, and I hear it all the time from people, oh, I'm good for retirement. I'm just going to sell my house. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. But when you want to retire, if the real estate market's weak, then you're not going to sell it for what you think you could sell it for. So one way of kind of taking advantage of this high market that we're experiencing, the fact that the market's gone up so much, is for certain people that um, can have the self-control not to borrow the money out of their house and go to Vegas and drop <laughs> that money, Vegas, right? Baby. Lose it. Right. And a lot of people, when you give them the liquidity, one of the reasons we love the concept of owning real estate is it's pretty illiquid. You buy it, and then when you do eventually want to retire, you have something to sell. But I actually argue that if someone has self-control, there are other strategies that they could consider by using money that they source, whether it's from income, whether it's from money that's sitting in the bank, getting a very low, low rate of return, or whether it's somebody with home equity that they go out and get a home equity line of credit. We believe that there are products that are principle protected. Now, Wall Street's not going to tell you this, guys. Wall Street doesn't want you to know about these products. So your initial this, investment, so principle protected is the concept that what you put in is being protected. Yeah, it's a financial institution that's saying that if you give us money inside of one of our structures, we will say that you cannot lose value, that your money can only go up, it cannot go down. And these structures have various different iterations. The first one people might be familiar with is one that gives you a fixed coupon. It might be 5 or 6%. And it, the benefit of these structures are they allow you to grow tax-free. So instead of having your money at a bank and maybe you're lucky enough to get a 5% CD for the next 12 months, instead of doing that, when you get your 5%, you're going to pay taxes on it. And that's mm -hmm. going to eat up depending on where you live. You may give up to half of the money you make in taxes. You live in New York or if you live in California. And if you do that, it's not as exciting to make 5%, right? Because you ended up netting two and a half. Right, right. So what we like is if you have a product that can give you that same 5%, but it can do it in a tax advantaged structure, it's even better. For example, if you owned it and you made 5% and it grew tax free, that's very compelling compared to making it in a CD in a bank where you owe taxes. So that's wow. the well, first So why thing. aren't more people taking advantage of this? Because Wall Street can't get paid on these products. That's the problem. Uh, okay, Street, so it's about money. It's about it's money. About, it always is. You trace back <laughs> the money. Always is about money. If you look at what Wall Street wants to do, they want to manage your money, they want to buy stocks and bonds. They want to buy a lot of stocks when you're young, maybe less stocks when you're older. And their argument is, look, you wait out the drawdowns. Market's going to go up. Market's going to go down. Net, net, after 40, 50 years, you'll make money. And they're not wrong. Historically, that's been the case. My issue is the velocity of those returns. My issue is worrying about the cycles. So what if you're retiring at age 65 and at age 64, the market loses 40% of its value or mm -hmm. more? And it can People don't mm -hmm. think it can, but it can. It's a market. So what we argue is that when certain people turn on a, a, a mindset that they don't want to lose any principal, there are products out there. These products don't pay Wall Street very well. So Wall Street's not going to tell you about it. You've got so to find These are lesser known yourself. products. Are there any risk, of like, like, you know, back when you go further back? Let's go back a little bit. Let's just dial it back to, you know, the, um, the, the, um, the implosion uh, around the, the markets and Lehman, and we all found out we had bad loans put in a bunch of different places, stuck with good loans. Is this money being um, aggregated so that it's stuck with other instruments that may not be as favorable? Yeah, I thought, you said we're going back. I thought we we're going back to 87, to the crash. All right, you just want to go back to 08? That's fine. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm, I'm we 50, can go back man. into 80. I, I People love nostalgia. I remember 87. I remember the feeling. I remember sitting there and talking to my grandparents in particular. It's very vivid. And they were so depressed about the stock market crash uh, because around that time, uh, my white one grandfather who retired at 65, he lost a lot of his money in the stock market. His broker told him just wait it out. Well, he didn't have a long retirement, unfortunately. He lost him when he was 66. I am blessed to say I had another grandfather 
around the same age is now a hundred, almost 101, still Ooh. alive. And I think the secret is probably never retiring. My grandpa still works. That's probably his secret. So uh, I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. That, but, that but, is what the people say in the blue the the authors of blue zones and things yeah. like that is that you know they don't really kind of you know sit in the in a vegetable and state and just watch TV and you know call it a call it a day after you're done. It's just you know being involved in something and having right. community and all of the rest. That's you that's don't need to awesome. work for money, but you can work for something else, contribute to others, and 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 help help people for sure. But to, to answer your question, look, the, the, the reality is Wall Street's trying to kind of herd your money into something that it could charge you 1% a year to manage. That's how they get a multiple on their businesses. They get a huge multiple because they have these assets that are sticky and people are told, just wait it out. Market goes down, it'll come back. And that's not my philosophy. My philosophy is something called absolute returns, meaning that every year we should be producing a return, a positive return for investors. So if you look at that 5% CD alternative, you can get that inside of something called whole life insurance, where you could have a certain amount of money that is, you can leave to your heirs, your children, your spouse, charity. But while you're alive, it can grow tax-free. It's protected from creditors and you could borrow against it tax-free and you're growing it. So it's going to compound faster. So that's one strategy as an alternative to owning a CD or a savings account. As an alternative to being in the stock market, Large financial institutions will give you the upside of the stock market with no downside participation. I'm going to mm. say that again because people don't believe me. There are products that you can have an uncapped upside of a market index and no downside. Market goes down 80%. How you're can at that zero. be? So, the break that down for me because that, yeah, you, you're talking Shocking, about right? something. So you're going against the grain, you know, with what oh, you're exactly. saying because it's not common knowledge and. How can that be that there is no downside? Because if I give you a ten thousand dollars, let's just say as a person, I give you ten thousand dollars, I'm, I'm hoping I get it back, right? And right. sometimes I don't get it back with interest. So how can it be that if if someone says, "Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do what you just said. I'm gonna put ten ten grand into what?" How is it that there's no downside? Ins a lot of the, the guaranteed products are issued by insurance companies. There's big ones that everybody knows about: Prudential, John Hancock. Mass Mutual, New York Life, Northwestern Mutual. These are all gigantic financial institutions. Uh, National Life's a good one that I like up in Vermont. Uh, these are companies that are offering a product, which is, it's depending on the product, but they offer products that are principal protected. That's the value over giving your money to a big investment bank that's going to invest it in stocks and bonds, which could go down. These companies are going to issue you a contract whether it's a life insurance policy or an annuity in which they're going to take control of those funds, they're going to invest it the way they want to invest it. It might be in real estate or venture capital, but what they're really doing is they're giving you exposure to an index. They tend to do that synthetically through an option, um, or it's a general account where they just say, look, we're going to guarantee this from our investments. What the secret that no one realizes is why are these companies able to offer a guarantee? Why can they tell you? Tell take your, because they are so profitable based on a very sad reality. Their profit comes from something called a lapse rate assumption pricing model. Fancy All right. So word. now, so for those that have word. never heard that, Let me take give the, the gear back. down a little bit and explain it to us feeble-minded layman so we can absorb it and understand and be educated about that. When you go out to a restaurant, you buy the meal, you eat it, it's over. You got value for it. When you buy insurance, you buy it and you got to keep paying for it for a period of years. Sometimes it's five years, 10 years, 20 years. Sometimes it's every year till you die. And guess what? People are not persistent. Persistency lacks. Now, what happens when you're young is you say, look, I bought this insurance. I just had a kid. I want to protect my family. And then life gets in the way. You don't have enough money and you got to get rid of things. It's one of the things that people tend to get rid of is their cash value life insurance. They say, mm. oh, I'll buy it again in the future. And that means their policy lapses. Their families are no longer as protected. And what I argue, of course, to people is make sure you at least have some term insurance, which is just basic death benefit in case something unexpected happens to you. The cash value insurance, which can grow tax-free, where you get the alternative to a CD, a fixed rate of return, or you get an index 
the way they're able to give it to you is they're giving it to you through a contract they offer and they make so much money because people don't keep these contracts. Mm -hmm. I sometimes get a question because a lot of times my older clients don't always get the bills. So I say, are they purposefully not sending bills to old people? So they lapse Mm -hmm. the policies. I don't want to say anything bad about insurance companies, but I always wonder for the, the few carriers that I see that happening on a regular basis, that's pretty nasty. So what I say is I know the reality. People do not hold on to the insurance until their death. And that's why insurance companies have these gigantic buildings in these big cities, right? Sure. They're all these big towers. It's because they make a ton of money. Uh, they make money on normally the term insurance because people buy the product and they outlive the term. They've done nothing wrong. They just got a very cheap product and they were healthy and no accidents occurred or no disease and they lived. And then the policy's done. The insurance company owes nothing when they die. And all those years of premiums go to the bottom line of that company. So that's why Mm. companies are so profitable. But what I tell people is you can take advantage of the fact that we are in a free market talking about Wall Street and competition. Well, how do insurance companies compete for your business? If they're selling you a million dollars in death benefit, they compete on price. They want to lower the premium every year to get to the absolute lowest price that they win your business and they still make money. So that's what they do. The other thing they do is they pay your broker an ungodly amount of money in commissions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) One of the most lucrative businesses is being an insurance broker. I hate to say this. I have a lot of friends. Well, you're talking to one right here on the screen above me. All right. All right. He he knows a little bit about that. He knows it's a lucrative business. Now, I know, Dave, that you you are sensitive to the fact that sometimes people can't afford to buy insurance. And one of the things that we probably, I'm sure you agree with me, There are products out there that if somebody wanted to finance the premiums, same way they finance a car loan or a mortgage on a house, my belief is someone needs a certain amount of tax-free income in retirement. If you need that certain amount, whether it's 10 grand a month, 20 grand or 100 grand a month, we need to go backwards from that number. We've got to figure out how much you need in protection to build tax-free over your life. So therefore, by the time you retire, you have that income coming in tax-free because I hate 401ks. I hate them. Tell me, tell me. So every, every, a lot of companies offer it. A lot of employees take it because that's what's offered through the company plans. Why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I use a 401k? They're matching me dollar for dollar up to $2,000. Hold on, on. let me, let me change my statement. If someone's going to hand you free money, Take the mm-hmm. match. No problem. Mm-hmm. You can take the match. All That's right. Gotcha. Money. That's different. But when it comes to somebody saying, I have all my investments in my 401k, I put so much money, every dollar I make, I put it, I challenge that because 401ks are taxable when you take the money out in most cases. So what people end up having it is having is an uncertain retirement. And mm-hmm. I want certitude. I want to know what I'm going to be able to take out. And I want to know that it's tax-free because I don't know what tax rates will be. And that's a core belief of mine. So one of the reasons that I think Dave and I can agree, insurance offers an ability to grow tax-free like a 401k, but it also allows us to borrow from it tax-free if we structure it properly. And when we borrow from it tax-free, we also benefit that this asset is protected from creditors as well. God forbid somebody gets divorced and you know wants to do some planning. This is a very healthy way of planning without being a cheat. You could buy insurance and you could protect your family, your children, even your ex-spouse, but you can hold on to that uh, during a division of assets because insurance is normally protected from that. So these products offer huge value and I use them even to take it to a whole nother level. But my idea is to finance with a bank the right amount of coverage. You can get 20, 30, sometimes 40 times your salary in financed life insurance. And again, we're doing this. So, so, let, so let's, 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 just, let's take, that, right. take that step so that I also the slow-minded people like myself, although oh. I lived in New York, I, I'm not in New York now, so the New York speed is slowed down a little bit in my brain. You Bad said deal. financing of those premiums. How does that happen? I did you just go to a bank and say, I need $100,000 so that I can do this? Or how does that happen? Normally, it starts with your insurance advisor. So you'd come to the advisor and say, look, I want this amount of coverage. I want 20 grand a month tax-free in retirement. And they build a plan for you. And a lot of times that plan requires a significant amount of life insurance and maybe even the overfunding of life insurance. Instead of paying it out over 40 years, 
You might pay it out over 10 years, compress the amount of years that you're paying. And the purpose is we're going to generate the upside of the stock market, potentially in a product that has, has an uncapped upside. There are products called indexed universal life. Some have a cap, like on the, a cap on the S&P 500. Maybe it's 9 or 10%, maybe 11%. Some products have no cap on an index. So if the index goes up 20% and you're holding that index inside your life insurance, you would grow all of that value tax-free and you'd participate fully in the increase. Value so when I go get that money, I go get that money. I'm as like, I hit 70. I'm like, I'm done working. You could get it or I'm going to slow down. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait. You, have to wait. So you like can go, retirement. you can draw it. You can yeah. draw on that, whatever you, you want. Tax-free. You're allowed to borrow from it tax-free whenever you'd like, whatever the cash in there, you can borrow tax-free. Awesome. So, well, yeah. you know, that's that you know, you are lighting up my brain cells right now with what you're saying, Jason. I, I'm you're blowing my mind away. It, we it, haven't even gotten to the good stuff. We well, haven't well even that's gotten to it. We're 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 getting there, but you know, all of us have had like an aha moment. I know for me, uh I did w- with the work I was doing before. And in you I love the passion that you have. It comes through with what you're saying within your voice, you have a lot of conviction. Where was your aha moment when you came, when you realized, you know, I don't know if this is, this Wall Street thing is working out right. You said you were in, your health was deteriorating. Was it that a health event uh, when you realized, you know, I could use my skills for something else other than making other people a bunch of money? What was your aha moment? No, it really was my health. Unfortunately, you know, I, I like a lot of people on Wall Street. I have an addictive personality. Uh, my addiction was to work. I was working 18, 20 hours a day. It was really unsustainable. Uh, and one of the things that I let go was all kind of uh, exercise. So I never did drugs and I didn't drink and I didn't. Uh, a lot of people on Wall Street, unfortunately, do drugs and drink. I uh, never cheated on my wife. But what I did do is I ate too much and I ate so much that eventually I developed type two diabetes. And it was killing me. It actually really was killing me. I actually had diabetic ketoacidosis. I was hospitalized. And it hit me. And I said, look, I'm not going to be alive very long. I have, uh, I have two beautiful children and I wanted to be there for them. Uh, and I said, I got to make a change. And I really couldn't figure out how to do it. I was taking so much insulin every day, which makes you voraciously hungry. So my aha moment was to say, look, my doctor is frankly telling me to just take medications and do the best I could. And I knew I couldn't really do it on my own. So a good friend of mine, gave me the advice. He said, look, you've got one of these personalities. I think what you need to do is take an active step here. And they advised me to get gastric bypass surgery. I did it. I lost 90 pounds. I went from 225 uh, down to about 130 pounds. And uh, and uh, I'm blessed because a lot of my health has been repaired. My numbers are good. Thank God I don't need uh, to take medication anymore. And And I feel like that was really my aha moment. I also was working for some incredibly wealthy people, doing a lot of these strategies for them and their employees. And what I recognize is not all those people were so nice. As a matter of fact, one of them didn't allow me to share my ideas with the public and uh, they passed away and I was able to work with uh, their, their children. I decided not to. And, uh, and I was able to reclaim my ability to share these views. And that was my aha moment. Uh, last week, I turned 50 years of age. I think it's a milestone. And uh, I truly want to be in a position where uh, where I can share this knowledge with others, help others, uh, and hopefully uh, allow them to have peace of mind, uh, the peace of mind that I am lucky to enjoy, uh, the peace of mind that I've been able to give my clients and their employees. Uh, and, and it's really helped my clients with their employees because I really believe that you need to find creative ways to recruit top talent, to retain that talent, and to reward that talent. And these are all the things that I do for my clients and their employees. And would you say that these strategies, uh, you said you're working with folks that have quite a bit of money, uh, these um, secret strategies that the rich and famous have been using for years, unbeknownst to the everyday investor? I can share two of them that I think are compelling and are appropriate for anyone of almost any asset size. Uh, and, I th- and, and I focus a lot of my practice I, I work with a lot of doctors and lawyers and tech executives. Um, those are those are more of my main you know day to day clients. I do have some incredibly ultra wealthy clients, um, and I help them with their employees. But the strategies that I like the most is the concept of wrapping your wealth into a vehicle which is not 
taxed. So imagine if you look at your tax return from last year and your account mm-hmm. prepared it, and you look at the section on capital gains taxes. Okay. Imagine mm-hmm. if that number went from whatever it is to zero. Would it be compelling for you? And that's mm-hmm. what I do. I bring people's capital gains tax down to zero. And here's how I do it. It's not rocket science. It's actually pretty easy. Life insurance, as I told you, is not taxed. If you buy an insurance contract and you get the performance inside of the cash of a bond or a stock index, that you're going to have that upside non-taxed. And when you want to access it, you could borrow against it tax-free. It's protected from creditors. Now, another interesting aspect of having a life insurance policy is you can wrap that life insurance policy inside of another policy called private placement life insurance, PPLI. What is that? It is the idea that you can take your portfolio of stocks, bonds, commodities, uh, you could have exotic cars, you can have anything you can imagine, venture investments, tech companies, private equity, you can have anything you want. But if it's owned by an insurance policy and not you personally or your LLC, which is taxed, or even a trust, which doesn't get an estate tax put on it, but it does get a cap gains tax treatment every year. You have to pay taxes on the growth inside of a trust. If you transferred your assets inside of a PPLI policy, there is no taxation on the growth every year. Zero. Hmm. So now when you want to access your 10x uh, tech investment that you made, guess what? When you access it, you access it instead of as a distribution, you access it as a loan. You borrow from the cash value. Yeah. No, no Uncle Sam treats well. a loan differently than distributions for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you could take up to your basis out of life insurance as a formal distribution, but then you start t- paying taxes on any of your gains. So we always recommend people just borrow out of the policy. You're basically paying yourself back. If you want to pay yourself or you never pay it back and it gets adjusted at mortality. So if you have a $10 million death benefit or $10 million cash value and you borrow out 5 million, your family is only going to get 5 million at mortality. So that's okay because you're entitled to live your life. You made the money. And I always say to people, insurance is one of the most attractive entities to use. And especially if you could figure out ways of avoiding these gigantic commissions, which you can, there's something called an enhanced cash value rider. And if your advisor is not offering that to you, I suggest you ask them about it. They might right. not like me very much after that, frankly. And, uh, and, I've, and I'm not exaggerating. I've had three death threats from insurance. Workers, so really- <laughs> but you know what? You, you bring up a good point because, you know, um, people tend to work for what works for them, uh, if it's a financial incentive or otherwise. And that tends to be the motivation for my modus of operandi, how I'm going to move forward with things, where I'm going to put my energy, because this is what butters my bread. And before you answer that, I want to show you something here from a show I'm sure you recognize that leans into that. So, Ori, go ahead and roll that next clip. Wags, ever get tired of working for a living? Every damn day. But I've got a nasty addiction called money, so I do what I do. You? No, never. Until today. You know, they call us traders gamblers. The world economy is just one big casino fueled by a giant debt bubble and computer-driven derivatives. There's only one thing better than being a gambler in a casino. That's being the house. That is right. There's a systemized machine out there sucking capital from localities and injecting it into the global markets where it can be used to speculate and manipulate. And if something goes wrong, there are bailouts and bail-ins, federal aid and easing, where the government doesn't hunt you down, but instead gives you a nice soft net to land in. That's your answer to the fireside chat. You want to become a bank? I want to become a bank. In order to rob it? In order that I don't have to. That's a great clip. I don't know if you watch. Did you watch Billions? Uh, I watched a couple of episodes. It is funny. Yeah, it it, it obviously based on uh, Steve Cohen's point seventy two, uh, not too far from where I lived in Westport, Connecticut, for many many years. So yeah, it's a great show. I, I think there's certain aspects of it that might be realistic. 
uh, to uh, hedge funds. And, and so what do you think about what you just saw, which is, you know, an exchange there with Wags and, and Bobby Axelrod talking about how to get richer, right? And big institutions, which is what his character represents, there's a certain type of motivation. And what I want to ask you was, is that motivation real? And then what's the implication for people that work at organizations like this? You know, are we seeing fiction play the reality or is the reality leading to fiction? What, what's, what do you say since you've been in part of that organ, you know, part of that world? Yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, the man that sat next to me at Cantor Fitzgerald um, covered Point uh, Seventeen. It was called SAC at the time, so well, I, I, I definitely uh, uh, had some exposure uh, and knowledge there. Um, I, I would say that uh, it is part of the mentality, which is to find ways of generating returns without the same risk. And of course, banks do that, right? Banks will take twenty, thirty percent of your money and then give you a mortgage. Their risk is that the value of real estate goes down. If you don't pay that mortgage payment to them, they're, they're in trouble. They seize the house, they sell it, and they could lose money if they sell it at a loss. I've always been a proponent of saying to people, be like a bank because banks tend to make money. So a lot of the investment strategies that we pursue are being your own banker in a way as mm -hmm. something called asset-backed lending, same way a bank would lend you money. If you said to me that that watch on my wrist is worth $10,000, and you'd love, and I needed a thousand dollars real quickly for something, and I gave you collateral of a ten thousand dollar watch. That's not a bad loan to make if you're holding on to the watch. So I don't mm -hmm. pay you back the thousand. You go out and you can either keep the watch or you could sell it. If you want to be nice? You can give me the difference. Wall Street's not nice, so sometimes they just grab the collateral and they make the money. Right. So I'm a big believer in that as an investment strategy. And most of the people listening to this and watching this have no exposure to asset-backed lending as an asset class. And that's because big investment banks and big asset managers don't offer that to their clients. And I think that's a shame. They really should give people exposure to private credit, to asset-backed lending. These are strategies that are not correlated to the stock market going up and down. I'm sick and tired of watching 65-year-olds lose their wealth right before they want to retire because the market crashed. And it's mm -hmm. not fair to them. So I believe that people need to ask questions. They need to demand transparency, the title right. of my book. Like your book. And yeah. They've like got to demand book. it from their advisor, from their lawyer, from their accountant, from their insurance broker, and from their money manager. My business is a multifamily office. What we do is we sit there and we try to direct everybody down the road of what the client wants. If the client's looking for tax minimization and looking to not lose principal, and we have to set the investment manager straight and let mm -hmm. them know that stocks are not the right investment for that client. If the CPA is unwilling to look at strategies that eliminate taxation because they're just not familiar with it, mm -hmm. well, that's a failure. And we need to either get that CPA back on track or have them terminated and get them off the team. Because mm -hmm. what I do is I act as a quarterback on the team or I think of me as a maestro of an orchestra. And I lead everyone down the same path that the client wants. And for most of those clients, it's tax efficiency. For most of those clients, it's creating tax-free income. And for most of those clients, it's not losing money in their investments. And these are all things that could be accomplished if they look and they start. I, I tell you what, most of the time a client brings me in to talk to their lawyer or accountant. They say, oh, no, no, this is not right. What you're talking about, not right for my, our client. And I, I push and I say, why? Don't just say it's not right. Give me a reason why you don't believe it. Is it because you're not familiar with it? Mm -hmm. Is it because no one ever taught you these strategies? It's not your fault, Mr. CPA. You've been a record keeper. You've helped your client pay the taxes they owe. But if you want to be relevant, that's by one of the words my daughter says, this person's relevant in school or relevant. You want to be relevant in this equation. You've got to add value. You've got to bring ideas to the table that, that eliminate taxation. You can legitimately do things in the tax code. We are not talking about tax shelters here, guys. That's so so it's not parking my money in the Caymans that you were talking about. No, Set up a trust a in the Caymans and, you know, that holds all my, my wealth. And when I retire, cha-ching, Uncle Sam can't touch a penny of it. No, you will be going to jail, my friend, in your time. <laughs> I am too short, and I am not strong enough to defend myself in jail, so I'm not going. Nothing <laughs> that I do 
You don't want to be somebody's boyfriend when you get there. No, I don't. (laughs) My my wife would not approve of that. She's a tough lawyer. So no, no, not not our thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do everything in the tax code. I'm going to read the code like no one else has read it. I'm going to find strategies that are directly in the code. People always say, well, my lawyer created a legal opinion on this. Well, that means it's a tax show. That means that they're interpreting tax law. And you might get away with it. I'm not saying, you know, every tax shelter you get penalized. But what I want to tell you is you don't need to do that. There are easy strategies that don't cost you so much money to pay for some legal opinion. And for Mm -hmm. regular people like you and me, there are strategies that we can use that can help us reduce volatility, not have big swings in our portfolio, grow our wealth tax free, protect it from creditors and allow us to sleep at night and generate really strong returns and eliminate taxation. These are all things we can do. We can even reduce your W-2 or 1099 taxes. Wow. I can bring those taxes down to zero. Wow. Let me through with something called a DAF, a donor advised fund. I've got some unique strategies and I employ your listeners to get in touch. You know, one thing that's funny about me is I have this book. I'm not making any money on the book. I put the book out at 99 cents. I don't care. I'm actually donating any money I make to charity. I could care less. What I want to do is share these ideas. If any of your viewers and listeners want to get a copy, it's on Amazon. It's called Demand Transparency. If they now, want to Ori, get it, you want to put it up. If yeah, you've got a like shot of it, video. yeah. Or you, you've got a, you've got the page on Amazon. He'll put it up while we're talking. All, right. um, all I say is, if somebody wants it, I would say to you, if you don't like the book, send me a text. You send me a text. And I will refund it. I'll Venmo you the money. I'm literally <laughs> going to give out. I'm going to give out my cell phone number I've had for 30 years. Okay. Because I believe that if you can't keep this, I know people that change the cell phone every year. And it's because they don't want people calling them. So I don't have that kind of situation. <laughs> so here's my cell phone number. There you and, go. And there's a section there that says digital version somewhere. There it is. Hey, uh, where is it? It's not. Oh, there it is up there. Kindle, 99 cents. So yep. if you do that, I, you, 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 you contact me. You tell me you didn't like the book, you didn't find it helpful, I'll ca- I will send you the money back. My cell phone is my New York number, 917 area code, 917-603-2365. That was 917-603-2365. If you don't like the book, let me know. Send me a text. You got your 99 cents back. My there pleasure. you go. We're putting it on the screen as well right. for those that are, are watching us on the video side of things. You can see the number. And, you know, you can give Jason a piece if you think it's full of malarkey or not working. But I suspect how passionate you are about this and and how under the radar and and the fact that the big firms aren't pushing it because you said they're not going to be making a lot of money on this kind That's of right. instrument. It's yeah. it's it would seem to me that it's almost out of favor. And um, I think that a lot of no matter what industry you're in, I think you're going to find the same thing where. There are businesses that will just keep doing what they've been doing because it's kind of working and this is what's paying the bills and this has the opportunity to really upset the apple cart. If if I stand to lose or lose some of those profits that were coming in, uh, I, you've really opened my eyes to something that I've only heard a little bit about and know nothing about. Uh, and I think that's a shame uh, because financial advisors should be offering value to their customers because at the end of the day, it's not just about collecting a paycheck. You want your clients to come out healthier than when they walked in the door. I wanted to ask you about that, given you know what happened during the pandemic and stocks really tanked, um, and although temporarily. How did your clients come out through that period of time when we saw stock prices implode now to only rebound to new highs? What were your clients telling you at the moment, given what you're saying, you know, you're know, you not going to lose your money if you're investing in some of these principles that you're talking about. It's preserved based on what you've already said. What were they telling you when the market was crashing at that time? Yeah. I mean, luckily they, they were ecstatic because their exposures were principal protected to the market. They had the upside of the market, but no downside potential. And it was because of the studies that I've done in Japan. I've spent a lot of time in Japan in my career and I've studied the market there. And the market for the past 30 years has actually been flat. You, If you had put your retirement money in 30 years ago, you wouldn't have made any money, no growth. Wow. 
It's crazy. 30 years. Could you imagine that? So what would you, what could you do to avoid that happening? And I actually think that's going to happen here in the United States. We're seeing much more choppiness. In Japan, the market wasn't just flat, not moving every day. It was up a lot and then down a lot. It was mm. choppy every day, up, down, up, down. So what I believe is that in some of these structures we talked about, if we can capture the upswing on an uncapped basis over every 12-month period, and when the market goes down during a 12-month period, we're flat at zero, we don't lose anything, we don't make mm. anything, but we don't lose anything, then we're going to eliminate all that volatility and our performance will be hundreds of percent better than someone that owns an index. And most of Wall Street says either buy mutual funds or buy an index because they're more effect- efficient. But mm-hmm. what they're forgetting is if you go, if you have it, if you are an index, you lose money. And in order to come back, you have to wait out until the index comes back. I right. don't want my clients to be in that position. I want them to always be making money. So I think there are products that exist out there that they can look at that will uh, tamp, that will really temper all that volatility and give them consistent returns. And Wall Street does not want to sell these products because they can't make money every year. If they manage your stocks and bonds, Mm. they can charge you every single year, 1% or three quarters of a percent, or some people pay one and a half percent. They charge you. They get valued as a company based on the assets they manage. These products pay a one-time fee or a very small fee to the advisor who presents it. So a lot of people don't show it because their firms don't allow them to. If your money manager is buying stocks and bonds- So what should, you, do, so what should people do? Let's, let's they say that people me. listening they to- They call me right now. <laughs> if people are listening to this and they say, you know, I'm, this, this sounds interesting, not sure, you know, uh, but you make a very compelling argument for a second look, third look even on my- my investments, where I keep my money, and and my retirement. You know, should people just have the first conversation where they park their money and say, hey, you know, I heard this guy talk about this and maybe be convinced out of it? Or should they just come straight away to you so that they have the right information that's right for them? What, What should they do? Well, because greed is good, I'd say come right to me. <laughs> Gordon, I know what it's best. Uh, if, if, if your advisor hasn't brought these ideas to you, it's because they really, in my opinion, aren't taking care of you properly. So my mm-hmm. recommendation is to, is to look at other people, may not be me, but talk to other people. Ask about non-correlated investment streams. Ask about absolute return investment streams. Ask about uh, uncapped indexes where you can capture the upside without downside. If you're not getting the right answers, well, study yourself. The reality is you can find out a lot about these products. There's information. I mean, I have clients, I have a real estate developer. He does different projects, but he owns his biggest wealth inside of one of these structures. He gets the upside. And when he wants to do a deal in real estate, he pulls the money out as a loan. He does his real estate deal, and then he puts it back in because he's getting money growing tax-free. I have some very unique approaches to three-year plans where someone doesn't need to commit a whole life of premiums. It's too scary. They don't want to do a bank loan to fund it. So what we say is how much can you put in for three years to create a retirement income stream? And we've got some very creative ways of doing that. There are some of these companies, these financial institutions, which allow you to borrow from your policy cash value after about three or four years. And then when you borrow it, you put it back into the contract as new premium. So even though you've loaned money out of the contract, you haven't put in your pocket, the money you borrowed out, you put back into the contract. Some companies don't allow it. I have about 45 different insurance companies I work with, and I have companies that are are comfortable with that. They know clients are borrowing from the cash value inside of their structures, and they're reinvesting it as new premium. So that's a very creative way. I call it self-financing or self-leverage. And Does this take a lot of discipline uh, from what you're saying? Because to take to take money out, like you said, not cash it out and woohoo, go to Vegas with it. But does that take discipline? You know, yeah. to be like, I'm I'm going to loan myself this money and I'm going to use it in this way, and knowing that I've got to pay it back. Or is, is this right for everybody? That's what I should ask you. Is this right for everybody? Because I, there's a certain amount of of like you said, you know, not blow it in Vegas, use it wisely. What say you about that? I I really believe people can do this stuff on their own. Um, But 
frankly, people don't. It's the same argument people use a trainer. They say, look, I know what exercise I need to do, but I'm not getting up in the morning and going to the gym unless I know I'm paying somebody and I don't want to disappoint them and I don't want to waste the money. So it's the same idea sometimes with a financial advisor. If you feel like you're going to be um, uh, unable to you know, take that loan and put it back in as new premium and instead you're going to go to Vegas, well, yes, you should have an advisor that you can call and say, I'm, a, I'm about to drop this money in, in gambling. Uh, you're, you shouldn't be doing that. Yes, you need somebody. But if you have self-control, if you're somebody that you know, can be coached, then I think there's an opportunity to do a lot of this on your own. Um, some of these products you can't buy direct from uh, you know, the, an insurance company. They sell through a distribution channel. You may need to use an advisor. But again, you want to ask questions like, are you aware of this enhanced cash value rider option, which would mitigate uh, the need for me to post collateral or a lot of collateral if I was to finance the premiums? These are good questions people don't know to ask. And those are the, that's some of the value that my firm brings to the table is we help people get the right amount of tax-free income. If someone says, look, with my expenses, I need 30 grand a month and I don't know how to do it. We know how to help them structure it and get it done efe- efficiently with as little money out of pocket as possible. Use the bank as your partner. And well, you know, become the old, become the bank. <laughs> you become the bank. Exactly. Like that's all right. Products. You we become the borrow, bank. Yeah. We could borrow for college funding. We could borrow for retirement income. We could borrow to buy that new home or new car. These are all reasons that you can end up financing. Instead of paying someone else the interest, you're in effect paying yourself because you own the financial contract that you're using to finance. I have people that every month when they get a paycheck, first thing they do is they put it inside of their tax-free income plan. Then they borrow it right out of the plan. And the reason they do that is they first want to start to grow that wealth tax-free. The money gets invested. If the market goes up 20%, and you're in an uncapped index, and then you borrow it out at 4% interest, you captured a 16% spread on your money. Mm-hmm. That's how you build wealth in retirement. So I'm happy. People should go on my LinkedIn. I post a lot of videos there explaining nope. everything we talked about in great granularity. So people can, can get informed, educated on this, uh, because I think when you present this kind of information, there are going to be some people that are going to be like, I'm on it now. And some people are going to take some action. And there's some others that, you know, I need a little bit more dribs and drabs. Let me let me get a little bit more for let my slow brain, you know, absorb this to see how I can when I can take some action on it. Because not not everybody's a New Yorker from Long Island and, you know, running 100 miles an hour, Jason. Some people, they're a little slower like me and they need a little more time and they need a little bit more to be fed that information to then, bam, I make a decision afterwards. It's my beautiful family. You're looking there celebrating my 50th birthday. I'm so blessed. I've got three brothers, two great kids. And uh, I was just spotlighted in Boca Raton Magazine for our unique business model, being a multifamily office, focusing on the legal structure, the accounting, the insurances, and the investments, all of that holistically oh, trying to figure out how to help others. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to share this stuff and, and hopefully really add a lot of value for people. And if they call me, I'm, I'm not a... Uh, an aggressive salesperson by any means. I really like to help people. So I'm happy if they want to text me, we could set up a time. I've got a calendarly function and we're happy to chat and just kind of share knowledge. And I think over time, I really believe that knowledge you know, wins out. And if your advisor is not providing you all of these interesting concepts, uh, there's a reason you know, why they're doing it. Probably their boss is telling them what to do. And I'm an independent firm. I answer to nobody. And that's really my pleasure. And I've been lucky enough to do that since 1999. You know, we talked about it earlier. I love what I, I don't view my work. I might do 10, 12 hours a day easily of work. And it's a pleasure to me. I'm just sharing knowledge and, and, and helping others. And I believe that's the most important thing you can do. My greatest pride has been the work that I've done to help people become more charitable. When they've saved money on taxes, they've been able to give more of their money away. And that's allowed me tremendous flexibility uh, and, and confidence in being able to share these ideas. And I really believe we all are here for a reason. It's not necessarily to make money. It's not to live in a fancy house and drive fancy cars. It's to help others. And I'm blessed to be able to do that every single day of my life. And I really appreciate you guys listening. I'm really so nice of you to invite me on. I really uh, enjoyed myself and uh, really a pleasure to meet you. Well, I, we have, but we're not done yet. I'm but not wait, ready there's to go. I'm more. just telling you I'm happy. We're, I'm just letting you know that I love you guys. There's more. There's more. We'd like to wrap up with a segment we call rapid fire it's whatever hits your brain whatever hits your brain is the right answer okay so you ready to play along rapid fire i am ready 
All right, Ori, hit us with the rapid fire segment. Yay. So Dave and I are going to give you a phrase and then just tell us what comes to your brain. I'm going to kick it off. Walmart versus Amazon. Walmart's a genius. They have 300,000 policies on their, uh, on their employees. Every employer should think about buying insurance on your employees as a benefit to them. And if they ever leave and they don't get their insurance, the employer owns it. So I think Walmart is smarter than Amazon. I know that they uh, wow they, they reward their their employees. They create discretionary work effort. They give them something, and I think it's powerful. Uh, and that's why I happen to think Walmart better company. But I wow I, but, uh, okay, I, that's the first. That is the first on that one. There you All go. right. All right. Favorite social media platform. I love LinkedIn. I think the quality of the people there are incredible. I've met so many lawyers, accountant, financial advisors, and they're honest. They come to me and they say, look, no one's ever talked about these ideas to me. Why? You know, how do you explain it to me? And I find these people, they watch my videos. We put out a lot of content. Uh, and I love LinkedIn for the professionalism of the people that are on there. It's an incredible group of people. I've got LinkedIn. tons more people on Instagram. They follow me, but rarely the questions that come out of LinkedIn are so incredible relative to, to Instagram. But I love Instagram too. I'm not saying anything bad about my Instagram. <laughs> I think I have twenty something thousand followers on Instagram. Well, you you you're the perfect guy for an Instagram. You know, you keep people awake and your 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 infectious enthusiasm. I could see it playing extremely well on Instagram. Thank so you. let me ask you the follow up here. Favorite piece of tech. Oh my God, my my iPhone. I mean, I live on that thing. I mean, I'm nonstop on it. I am so addicted to it. Uh, it's great. I could be anywhere. You have five minutes. You can respond to your LinkedIn. You can respond to everybody. Stay in touch with people with a quick text. Without my iPhone, I'd be nothing. I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> I, honestly, lost. I, live, I live on that thing. It's okay. awesome. Couldn't imagine. So this next, this next one coming in, I think I already know the answer. Yeah, yeah. First thing you reach for in the morning. iPhone, for sure. Actually, my wife first. Got to give her my <laughs> It's awesome. Valentine's Day. Shout out to my wife, Dana, who's put up with me for 20 plus years. Incredible nice, form. nice, nice. There you go. Um, this is where we, this, these next two, this is where we like to learn even more, uh, where, where maybe we have some blinders on. What is your favorite piece? I'm sorry, favorite podcast? Oh, that's a good one. Well, I, you know, I, I love a good friend of mine, actually. My college roommate is Guy Raz. Uh, he has incredible, he's got like, I think the five or six top podcasts. Just Google his name. Guy uh, in, at Guy Raz, R A Z. Uh -huh. He's a he's a superstar. He's always coming out with a new podcast, and he's just so insightful. Uh, I just recommend him. You know, he, not only was he a great roommate, but he's a great person. Really okay. intelligent. You'll always awesome. Guy R A Z awesome. is his last name. Cool. Other than your book, what is a game changing book that you've read? I like the Forty Eight Laws of Power by Robert Greene. It's a very compelling book. It's I love history. I studied politics as an undergrad. And the book really does uh, share with you historical references of concepts of how uh, to be a leader and how to be powerful. And a lot of it is is very insightful. I think uh, Robert Greene's an excellent author. Okay. There it is. Terrific. And I think we've got that. Thank you, Ori, for pulling that up. The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Uh, it's available on Kindle as well. So if you like your electronic, not ninety nine cents though. Mine's I know it's sixteen ninety nine. I don't think to make money. I'm I don't giving it all to charity. My, my I don't, all charity. I, I don't think he's uh, guaranteeing the um, satisfaction guarantee like you're providing on your uh, so on your version. I don't see his cell phone out there. <laughs> 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 oh man so we, we've been talking to jason mandel is there anything you want to leave us with before we go i would just say to people if they want to look at look up some good stuff i have a website it's the mandel family office.com t-h-e-m-a-n-d-e-l family office.com uh, i think you'll get some good insight on that site i have a youtube channel i've got um you know a bunch of stuff on instagram wherever you want to look me up I, I hope the information's helpful to people. Um, don't hesitate in getting in touch. I love helping people. And if I could share knowledge, then I, I think that's uh, the reason I'm here on this earth, frankly. I want to help others. I want people to avoid some of the disasters. And I do think we're in for a rough couple of uh, years ahead, frankly. And I am scared for people. And I want, I think you got to take action right now. I don't believe it's prudent 
uh, unless you really have so much money, it doesn't matter if you lose a lot in the market. But if, if you're looking to retire and you've got money in the stock market, we could see some volatility. Why not own your equities where you have no downside? You can still get the upside at the stock market without the downside. And I think it's important to explore that. Love it. Love it. You, you, you've you opened my eyes to something that I knew very little of. And I think that our audience is it's going to feel the same way. Like, hmm, to some it's going to be like, hmm, let me look at it. And some are like, what? What? But nevertheless, the information is out there for each person to decide what to do with it. You know, should you store it away and do something with it or just dismiss it? But I love the fact that you've exposed me to something new today, um, challenge conventional thinking. And I think we need a little bit more of that. And I think everybody can do a little bit of their own homework to see if it's going to benefit them in a, in a positive way. So Jason, I, I really appreciate you coming on today. And if you want to nerd out on what it means to be a leader in this new environment of remote work and why all the action is in the suburbs, you want to check out that episode that we did with Amina Moreau of Radius. Uh, you know, Dave, we, we, we found out that a lot of stuff is going on in the suburbs. So if you could, if you want to do an Airbnb, but for business teams, and so forth. You want to hear why, again, the action is in the suburbs. So go check out that episode that we did with Amina Moreau. So thank you, Jason, for joining us today. And we will see you next time. Thanks, Ro. Thanks, Dave. Really All appreciate right. it. Bye-bye. And lastly, if you're checking this out on YouTube, Dave and I have some videos just for you that can help you accelerate your business. Go ahead. It's somewhere over here on on, a, on this side of the screen or this side of the screen, Dave and I will join you in those episodes. See you then.